Please let me know if you can't hear me if my voice starts to, starts to drop. So this paper will have some interesting echoes with the paper uh, we've just heard and uh, we should have a good conversation afterwards, I think. So let us begin uh, once again with the title of our conference, Imagining History. And since the artist I will be uh, speaking of in this talk is working in the 21st century, I would like to balance ideas of futurity uh, with those of the past. There is a past and a future in this imagining history. A past that holds or does not hold the archives, the traces of women's lives and work and which has been limited by modes of thinking, modes we might actually understand as technologies that have produced the histories through which we know our world and our place in it. And there is a future that we imply, hope, and indeed produce through our own work and the choices that we make, imagining a future for whom our histories will be legible and supportive. So I would like to argue that we need to look back and forward if we're to begin to answer the questions posed by the call for proposals. Is it time for a new history of women in, uh, um, and art in Canada? And if so, what might such a history or histories, set of histories look like? With other scholars who've gone before, we need to interrogate past histories, not only the archives that exist, but the technologies of archiving that determine whose stories remain and offer frameworks that allow some stories to be heard and not others. And we need to attend to our present with its own technologies of knowing in order to imagine a possible future, what histories do we want to be told of our time? In asking where we have come from, if there is one thing we have been doing, um, and perhaps doing well, it has been to find and celebrate the work of women that rivals those, that of men male artists of their time, to read against the grain of the archives, building counter-archives. But we have also worked along the grain, as Anne Stoller has taught us, to understand better the way our knowledge and technologies of history have been constructed, how our views of knowing have been produced. We have investigated the ways of knowing that have produced limited, male-dominated archives, and demanded that the terms of evaluation and of what is important in history be changed. The documents of everyday life are now understood as important as those of public events. And collaborative art we now see as just as important as the art of the lone genius. Indeed, the inquiry is no longer about the genius or sometimes not even about beauty in art, but the social, historical, and cultural meaning of making art. We understand art to be a situated practice, to use the language that some feminist theorists have taught us. Art comes out of the place in which it is created and in which the artist is located. So that locatedness is understood not only in terms of nation or region, but of gender, race, class, sexuality, age, abilities, and other institutional and cultural formations. We understand that our bodies and our bodies of work are thoroughly cultural entities. In asking where we are going, it seems appropriate to ask what work our currently new technologies are doing. as tools, 
and as mediations and as producing new subjectivities and bodies. Also, how might they in turn be used to shape an imagined history of our choosing? Sorry. Sorry. Um. I'm afraid we can't do anything. Yeah, okay, yeah. fine. Um, sorry, this is um, this is a list of the artworks that I'll be um, attending to. Keep my eye, eye on my slides here. Um, so in asking where we are going, it seems appropriate, as I started to say, to ask what work our currently new technologies are doing as tools and mediations and producing new subjectivities and bodies. Also, how might they in turn be used to shape an imagined history of our choosing? How can we still talk of embodied and located art as we watch the digital iterations of a POV camera or GPS tracking? Where's the body? Where's gender? And where's history in all of this? So my paper brings into conversation the issues of embodied art, practice, and the use of new mobile technologies. And what work can, can and ask this question, what work can this new technology accomplish? What does it promise? So in thinking through these questions, I look <clears throat> to examples from the work of the multimedia artist Liz Platt, originally trained in Connecticut um, and in California at UC San Diego, and then through an exchange program in Nova Scotia at the College of Art and Design. Having taught film and video production at Rutgers University, she has been living and teaching for the last 10 years in Hamilton, uh, Ontario at McMaster University, and is presently in the process of becoming a Canadian citizen. Liz Platt, uh, Platt's work has been broadcast uh, widely, uh, including on PBS and, and other networks. It's been acquired by the Whitney, by the Library of Congress, um, among other places. It's been shown at MoMA and uh, in many uh, sites. Uh, her work uh, has been seen in exhibitions, video festivals, broadcasts, including in Prague, St. Petersburg, Havana, Melbourne, Seoul, Hong Kong, Cologne, London, Paris, etc. She was awarded the Director's Citation, Honorable Mention, at the Black Mariah Film and Video Festival, Jersey City, the Golden Apple Award at the National Educational Film and Video Festival, the Honorable Mention at the Oregon Gay and Lesbian Film and Video Festival in Eugene, and Director's Choice Award at the Atlantic, Atlanta Film and Video Festival. So I'd like to begin with an artist statement that Liz Platt has on her website. As an artist, I'm committed to an experimental approach which utilizes hybrid forms, combining personal narrative, critical analysis, humor, and gender politics my work explores the way various representations, popular, subcultural, artistic, inform our understanding of ourselves within the world. Drawing heavily on camp and parody, my work attempts to playfully unravel some of the intricacies of identification, representation, and subjectivity. My use of humor is a conscious strategy intended to increase accessibility and reach an audience that may not be open to or interested in queer subjectivities. Liz Platt's early work is interested in the misrepresentation of bodies. For example, an early series of photographs shows Platt's parodic playing with the structures of knowledge and identification that are taken as normal or natural in our society. Her 1992 photographs, Looking Long and Hard, reworked uh, art representations from 17th century still life paintings to modernist 
photo photographic nudes, notably, uh, notably Weston's, inserting erotic objects uh, in the midst um, imperceptibly or quite perceptibly. Questioning the conventions of both art and uh, male produced heterosexual morality. She says of this work, it examines the power inherent in representation, who gets to represent and how representation constructs particular subjectivities. The piece parodies the conventions of art history to subvert and demystify this privileged site of representation. It provides me with a space to play out my transgressive desires and to take up a new position of power. Her earlier films worked with empty, sorry, with campy queer parody for an instance, for as for exist, instance in a video called Purse. What is the place and use of a purse in a butch's wardrobe. So if the woman's handbag is associated with femininity in a butcher's every day, that object must be strange. Where to put it, how to wear it. Or if the ideal female body has been understood as restrained, delicate, and contained within, a, say, painting at home, and executed with a delicate brush stroke, Platt puts on her hockey skates, or in this case, rollerblades, drops the puck in paint, and shoots into a goal-shaped canvas. Here are action paintings from a woman in an iconic Canadian movement. She explores the relation between the physicality and art, but ironically, producing in the process a set of lyrical art pieces rather than the campy situation dramas of the earlier video works. This series is called Puck Paintings. Or in Body Works, Platt photographs in micro detail the bruises on her skin from sports injuries, hockey, mountain biking that in their cropping and focusing are reminiscent of both abstract paintings and police documentary evidence. The ironic beauty of discoloration is an attempt to rewrite and re-envision the female body, not as passive victim, but as action hero. Keeping in mind these earlier critiques of representation and the use of body in her art, I turn now to a recent project employing new technologies. Her 2010, oh, sorry, that's a uh, museum display of uh, body works. Her 2010 technological exploits or the Orbi project, convenient, um, conveniently for my purposes, includes mediation, meditations on the history of exploration in our country, on scientific knowledge and experimentation, on new technologies, performance art, the body's relation to both the land and art, queer parodying, everyday life, audience participation, time, and even history. So we begin uh, with an invitation from the Gordon Pinsent Center for Art in Grand Falls, Windsor, Newfoundland. Every year they host a curated Art X workshop with a call for work on a specific theme posted internationally. In 2010, their theme was the river as source with a call to relate a new art piece to the Exploits River that runs through Grand Falls, Windsor. So in the beginning was a call, a call for work on something called exploits. A little known, to some of us, unknown, territory of Newfoundland and Labrador. A river, a source, the unknown, 
and a name exploits. Platt begins to imagine the river and the project. The river's history and history of rivers in Canada and exploration history. She looks back and forward, back to the technolo technologies of exploration and the knowledge those technologies supported or out of which they were produced, a knowledge that we have come to understand as modernity's rationalist and positivist belief in mastery over and exploitation of land and its peoples. She also looks forward to contemporary technology and asks what knowledge it can perform. The 2010 ArtX website announced Platt's, sorry, announced Platt's project in this way. It will be a, as a means of exploring the pervasive influence of technology in all aspects of our lives, com combining performance art, installation, GPS, and web-based tracking, documentary photography practice within the framework of a scientific experiment. Technological exploits is an opportunity to find out how an unguided technological traveler experiences and represents the exploits river. The new technology entailed GPS tracking through SPOT. The specific technology takes us into the world of contemporary exploration and adventure when adventures, those going ventures, those going on exploits beyond cell phone um, read civilized territory for fun, they now can take with them a GPS tracker that beams back location and information um, for, uh, from a satellite in case you get lost and are in danger. There are various levels of service uh, you can get with this uh, from Mountain Equipment Co-op. Uh, and in fact, Platt chose a tracking device that would send a signal back up to satellite and home again every 10 minutes locating its whereabouts. The next component was a POV camera designed originally to take photographs from a surfboard and which Platt had already used in videoing her own mountain bike uh, riding. She invented her technological device in the end, which was, had the flavor of bricolage, of putting things together, as much as it does of a science lab. The casing for the technology that would combine, in, that would hold uh, the, the camera and the uh, space-time tracking device was to be a large plexiglass um, uh, orb of great strength and durability, designed and normally used for street lamps. Platt understands this artwork as a performance. She imagines and stages the exploration as a mock scientific experiment or discovery launch with the lab coats and launch ceremony speech. Here we are on the banks of the mighty exploits river. Then the science began, the engineering putting together the machine, the team launching the technology in the water, the retooling, or at least re, uh, situating the technology when the orb got blown away into the weeds and the rocks. Um, the recording, note taking, logging. I'm going to do this a bit like a like a movie. Um, the the actually launching there of the orb in the water. Uh, the filming, of course, through, throughout as a, as a logging, as experimental logging. The um, taking, the viewing, and the observing, and the taking notes, all of this empiri empirical data, both on the water and here ret uh, retrieving it from uh, being stuck. And then eventually its space being uh, tracked through the satellite data at a kind of home base or military or CIS base uh, with time and place plotted on a map. Once the orb, um, which had by this time taken on a, a familiarity and was being called Orby, is retrieved from the water 
uh, this is the logging back at the uh, command base also with people in lab coats. Um, once it was retrieved from the river, the digital images are downloaded, taken out, the camera's taken out, they're downloaded, and a series of still photos that have been taken every two seconds of its journey are looped together into a, a slideshow um, of 12 minutes long and a shorter video that is then on, put on the web. And then displayed uh, for uh, all the people to come and see at the Gordon Pinson Arts Center. So indeed, this is a mock scientific experiment, but uh, about exploration. But the findings are more than just a parodic critique of traditional science, technologies, and ways of knowing, domination of nature, of time, and place of land. It also has other dimensions. Platt, in fact, is a new media um, artist and uh, instructor. She teaches a graduate course on surveillance technology. And she'd always actually wondered what images the Orbi would produce. This was a genuine exploratory question she had as she started her work. As the installation and exhibition uh, continued, the project started to call forth involvement and interaction from people who are, were attending. First, those who had had an interest in, the in water already, those who have been working on the protection of the water in this p p area, became involved in the planning and the execution of uh, stages the project. During the exhibition, those who came to view it recognized sites on the river where their friends or relatives have had cabins. So the technology that was to view the river from a point of view never seen before uh, called forth in the end a new, uh, a kind of reiteration but new connection to the river. The images entered their everyday life the images entered their everyday life, showing it in a new way. And this, I would argue, is a new archive then, intervened in, which intervened in a way that um, counterintuitively might be compared to the surrealists walking the streets of Par Par Paris, um, seeing the street in, in a new way for the first time. As Ben Highmore has argued, their work was that of rescuing the everyday from conventional habits of mind to attempt to register the everyday in all its complexities and contradictions. I must, of course, acknowledge that there are multiple dangers and criticisms of what the new technologies are creating. Liz Platt herself, who teaches a graduate course, um, has called Facebook a massive surveillance mechanism for mining aggregate information. So the futurists at Intel, uh, or someone like Gilad Elbaz, uh, who had an article about him in the New York Times lately, and his startup company Factual, uh, will aim to collect every existing fact, quote, this is Elbaz. Lately, I've been thinking, I should move on, really. These are, these are the images of the river from Orbi. Um, lately, says Elbaz, I've been thinking that we need to get more personal data, he says. And Quentin Hardy in the New York Times points out that he doesn't mean names and addresses, but their genetic information what they ate, when, and where they uh, exercised. Ideally, for everyone on the planet, now and forever. I want to figure out a way, he says, to get people to leave their data to science. If Alan Sekula has identified the filing cabinet and the photograph as central archive technologies of the 19th century, we will need, of course, to account for social media, the web, 
and mobile technologies as foundational archives in the early 20th, 21st century. Yet without losing sight of the massive dangers of these new technologies, can we, like Arjun Appar Apparad sorry, Ap Apadurai, um, see the quote that are um, the quote the non-hierarchical digital and para-human characteristics of the electronic archive and remind us that archives are not only about memory and the trace of rec or record but about the work of the imagination about some sort of social project in the future we will want to look back and see how artists were imagining possible uses of these technologies. Wherever the new world will begin, whatever the new world will bring, we will want to know how some were imagining possible futures. So histories always begin with the forming of archives, the traces we choose to record and to house, and when we look back, we will see that some were not only critiquing their own past of exploration and exploitation, but also curious about ways of imaging and imagining the world. And that's a quotation from Liz Platt. Ones in which play, parody, invention, and interactivity were possible. Even in 2002, Mark Poster could turn to everyday virtual life and suggest that in its anonymity and in its lack of hierarchies, it might offer a utopian horizon that freed subjects from subjected states of race, gender, and sexuality. Can we use these new technologies to reveal and critique the ways our bodies have been fixed? but also to play and to dream of other embodied and emplaced ways of being. My, my time, my time. Finish. I'm gonna end there, thank you. Thank you. <laughs>